when I came to the University of Wyoming um, 21 years ago, the first year I spent just trying to get on my feet, organize the collection, we have about 50 to 60,000 books. Uh, and I realized that in addition to people coming in to maybe read them, research them, I wanted to bring in people myself. And so I thought, well, what better way as a faculty librarian slash archivist than to teach a semester long class? But I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a whole semester where I could teach book history using the Taupin materials? The history department picked it up. And so now this will be the 18th year that every fall semester I teach book history, but I try to make it special topics, so every semester it changes. Last fall was Gothic and Renaissance books, 15th and 16th century. This coming fall is America from the 17th to the 20th century. And the wonderful thing about our collections here is because they're so eclectic and we have books from the 15th century up that we can do any kind, I shouldn't say any kind, but many different kinds of subject presentations for um, whatever department, whatever class, or for the book history. And what I really like to do is be able to use the books for different purposes. So I may be able to use a book for the printmaking class coming in, but then I could also use it for the book history class to show something about the 19th century, the 18th century, gender, politics, race, um, religion. We have a lot of books of, of different religions. So we look at all different historical, cultural, social aspects. I brought out just some of the books that we'll be starting the um, lectures with for the America Book History course this fall. And what I usually do is lecture for like on the Tuesday and then on the Thursday the students get to have a book lab where they answer some questions and get to um, have a first-hand experience themselves with the books. Some of the aspects that I talk about in these I brought out because there are some particular illustrations that, that I think are, are quite instructive. For example, in this one, this is the volumes from 1590 to 1610. They're bound up. There are three um, volumes. In fact, I just brought out volume, the first one. These are the de Bries, also sometimes pronounced debris. He was a Flemish publisher who later worked in Frankfurt, Germany. These are published out of Frankfurt um, from in that time span. They're original copper engravings, but in fact are mostly etched. But I have it open to a couple of pages that are my particular favorites. This is one of the wife and daughter of one of the early contact um, Native American groups with the settlers in New England. And what we see with this child, if you look closer, and I hadn't noticed this, but one of my student assistants one day said, oh, Anne Marie, I just love the doll in this Indian girl's hand. And I said, what doll? <laughs> And if you look closely, there's like a trade item here. It's, it's a little doll from England, dressed in uh, kind of Tudor, Jacobean clothing. And the contrast of the cultures between the, the early settlers bringing in English goods to trade with or give as gifts to the local inhabitants. And I have a contrast, which I think is quite fascinating. I'm a member of the Renaissance Society of America, and one of the issues that came I noticed that the cover was a little girl in England. It's an oil portrait. She's holding a little doll that's very, very similar to this one. In this portrait, it looks right, doesn't it? It's what we would expect to see in England in the late 1500s, early 1600s. This looks like what we would expect. This is kind of jarring when we see this little girl who's almost naked, virtually naked, holding a fully dressed, very elaborately dressed English doll. So that, that is something to really think about, the contact between cultures that are so different. Because my background is art history, I have bachelor's and master's degree in art history as well as my master's in library science, then I often focus on the book illustrations, particularly in books in languages that the students can't read. So I don't want them to be intimidated if a book is in Latin or Italian. I just said, let's look at the illustrations and how that, the visual literacy, and for people who can't read or who don't know a language, it is the importance of the illustrations. And in, in terms of looking closer at the details, sometimes there are changes that you don't notice right away between editions, why, which is why it's important to have different editions of books. We have the 1624, Captain John Smith, General History of Virginia, New England, etc. And we have the 1627 edition. There are some very important differences. In 1625, uh, King James died. 
1624, Prince Charles is still Prince Charles. Look what's happened now. Someone has gone into the copper plate and etched a crown onto Prince Charles's head and now he's King Charles. And so it's a fascinating little difference that you don't see right away until you start looking. Also a difference between these two volumes is this one has a portrait of Pocahontas. And when I show this to students, they say, well, that's not Pocahontas. That doesn't look like Pocahontas as we think of her. But this is Pocahontas when she's in England. And you know, as, as the story goes, as some of the students know, some of them don't, she was getting ready to get on the ship to come back to America and died of smallpox, so never made it back home. But this is when her English uh, colonist husband had brought her to England. She was a hit with the Jacobean court. They dressed her up in English Jacobean clothing, but it doesn't quite look right. They say, but it doesn't look right. You know, they, they put it that way, it doesn't look right. So that gets them thinking about, again, this cultural, um, the connections and, and changes and interactions, intermarriages. But we do have a portrait of Pocahontas further. In both of these books, we have these fold-out plates and maps. And this is a little more documentary. We have, um, in the one above, Captain John Smith is fighting one of the Indian kings. And here he's being very brave, even though he's smaller, showing that he's so brave, he's got a gun. But he didn't, he didn't win that battle. And here he is on the chopping block. <laughs> and so he's looking very small here and very helpless. And this is the scene, which most students remember, where Pocahontas steps in to her father, Powhatan, and asks him to save the life um, of Captain John Smith. And look at the, the difference in scale, where he's very small now. Look how tall Pocahontas is. Um, so this is a wonderful image showing the size and the power of this particular Native American woman at this time and how she's saving his life. And in this case, she is dressed as she would have been dressed in her um, traditional clothing. So these are both images of Pocahontas from the early 1600s. Very, very different. It isn't all that common, actually, to have a welcoming atmosphere into a rare books library where members of the public as well as undergraduates. We do encourage people to come in and, and enjoy and learn from the books, but we try, and this is the phrase you often hear with uh, cultural repositories, to balance the access with the preservation. So yes, we are here to preserve the material for posterity, as for 500 years, these have been preserved for us. But what's the point in just having them locked up if no one ever sees them?